Good morning. Happy New Year. And to you too, New York. All right. <laughs> we know that place. So let's go back a little bit. 2022, we got to get used to typing or writing that. All right, we're going to do 2021 for a while. But let's go back to Christmas. I'm going to ask kind of a weird question, but we're going somewhere with it. Did anyone here, I can't hear you online, but you can ask yourself the question, did anyone here ask for a parrot for Christmas? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Someone said yes. All right, that would get interesting. I didn't either, and here's why. Parrots seem to be like a bad life choice, if we're being honest. Plus, I'm not a pirate, clearly, in my real life anyway. Bad decision. Think about it for a second. They live a long time, and they mindlessly repeat things. And with my luck, the parrot, if I had one, would mindlessly repeat all of the stupid things I say. That's a lot. It's a constant reminder. Now, imagine this, too. It could get you into big trouble. Imagine you invite the pastor over for dinner. And you have a parrot. Sermons are boring. Pastor's crazy. Hide the booze. <laughs> Dust the Bible. All right? So it could get you into trouble. And so I heard a story about a family that lived on a farm. And they had a parrot. And it was always getting the father in a lot of trouble, repeating the things he would say about his wife. So one day, somebody left the window open. And sure enough, the parrot flew out. It was lost. Well, opening the window also revealed another problem with other birds. You see, outside, there was a tree, and a flock of crows decided to perch there. A whole bunch of them. They made quite the racket. So one problem solved another problem created. It started driving the dad nuts. So he got his shotgun, loaded it with bird shot, a bunch of little pellets, spreads about a pie plate at that distance, starts firing a few shots into the tree out the window. The kids come running downstairs. Dad, what are you doing? What's going on? Ah, the crows are driving me nuts. So I shot them. Could have shut the window, just saying. So the kids went out to inspect the handiwork at the bottom of the tree. And sure enough, there were a whole bunch of dead crows and a dead parrot. Well, I feel sorry for the parrot. <laughs> the kids came back in to tell the dad what happened. And his reply was really simple. Bad company. We'll see today that we should indeed be careful about the company we keep and who we listen to. Birds of a feather. Bless you. Today we'll be continuing in the rest of the story. We've been looking at the life and the writings of King Solomon. That was last year, right? So we took some time to look at all those different things. So here we see the unraveling of the kingdom due to Solomon's sin. A lot of people don't know that. You can go back and watch the messages online. A lot of sin. A lot. He broke almost every rule set forward in the law of Moses, Deuteronomy 17, for a king. Every single one. Check, 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 check. Sin, sin, sin. People usually say, oh, he was really, really smart and wealthy, but no. He didn't often listen to his own advice. But the consequences are going to get passed down to Rehoboam, his son. And we're going to see that he doesn't really listen to advice either. And what you got to understand is we're looking at a divided kingdom now, a north and south, a split kingdom. We saw Ahijah the prophet. He anointed Jeroboam to be the king. The kingdom's going to be ripped away from Solomon and the symbolic ten pieces of the cloak 
goes to Jeroboam. And so it's a divided kingdom. I think I got a map there for you. So this is just a good visual. I don't usually use maps and things like that. But just to give you an idea, a picture here. So you see Jerusalem in the south. At first, Shechem is going to be the capital in the north. Later, King Omri, it'll be Samaria. So that's what it looks like. Ten tribes in the north, one or three in the south, I will explain. So here's what we see. Solomon's heavy taxation, labor force, all causes really big problems, especially for his son. That's now going to get passed down to him. We've also discussed in this series that sometimes we're running parallel, and that's why the Bible gets, well, not the only reason why, the genealogies don't help, but one of the reasons the Bible gets really, really confusing is because <laughs> it'll be several different accounts of the same thing with different little details, and so you pretty much lose your mind. So I made another chart. <laughs> so here we see that second, that I did not draw that. I've explained to you why I didn't draw that. The biceps aren't big enough. Anyway, so the guy got the young part right, but it wasn't so flattering. Anyway, I find it entertaining. You see here, we're running in parallel, Second Chronicles and First Kings. And we're going to stick with First Kings a little bit more today because it gives us a little bit more information. There's an interesting story in there that I want to share with you. So you can click that away. Uh, so <laughs> Solomon, he's not going to do it now. Solomon had two daughters. I can see everything you see right there. <laughs> he had two daughters. It's tricky to find that. We saw that in 1 Kings 4. They're just briefly mentioned there. And one son, Rehoboam. Now, as I said, he doesn't listen to his father or the Proverbs written to him or his wise counsel. So in this section, keep in mind, we're going to see a theme here. Cycles of stories that have to deal with not listening to good advice and or listening to bad advice instead. Not following instructions or instructions from the right people. So Rehoboam goes to be made king of Israel. So it's kind of pre-ish this split here. 1 Kings 12, 1. Rehoboam went to Shechem where all Israel had gathered to make him king. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard this, he returned from Egypt, for he had fled to Egypt to escape from King Solomon. The leaders of Israel summoned him, and Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel went to speak with Rehoboam. Your father, that is Solomon, was a hard master, they said. Lighten the harsh labor demands and the heavy taxes that your father imposed on us. Then we will be your loyal subjects. Okay, some background here. What's going on? So remember, Solomon wanted to kill Jeroboam, so he flees to Egypt. Now Rehoboam's in power, he comes back, and he's a part of this group of complainers, as some people call them. So Rehoboam, let me think about it for three days. Give me some time on this one, okay? That's reasonable. So the older advisors, they say, you know, if you're like a servant to them, they'll be like a servant to you. Wise advice. Just Lighten it up a little bit. Give them a little what they want. There's some problems here, right? Good advice. But he rejects that advice. So he asks the younger counselors, the people who had grown up with him. Let's just call them his friends. Here's what they say. Here's what you tell those complainers. <laughs> my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. He beats you with whips. I'm going to beat you with scorpions. So, wow, I know. So, some language that we may not understand except one person in the room and me. So, let me explain it to you. It's kind of harsh language, worse than you think. A little finger? Well, not quite. It suggests a part of the male anatomy. Use your imagination. Scorpions are like those lead-tipped whips. So, he beats you with like a leather whip. I'm going to flail you. I'm going to cut you open. So it's going to get worse. So here's what he does. He mindlessly repeats the advice of the younger advisors, like a parrot. Kind of stupid. So here's what happens. He's rejected. The people say, down with the dynasty of David. We're no longer, go back to your homes. We're no longer serving this guy. And then, indeed, we have the divided kingdom. They reject him. So another picture, 
And this is cool. This is the Bible project. It looks like it's for kids, but nope. The information on here is really good. So if you type in Bible project on YouTube, great videos. These are great summary videos of every book of the Bible. It helps you to understand it uh, in very plain language. But here you have that split. You get a little bit of a visual. Jeroboam in the north, Rehoboam in the south. Technically, the ten kingdoms. Remember, Ahijah the prophet. This is all fulfilled now. It's going to show you some of the things that they're going to do wrong. Now, remember the math on it. Ten kingdoms in the north, but wait, there's 12. Two kingdoms in the south. So, it'll say slightly different things depending on the context or what's going on. Judah in the south. But the Levites go there because that's where the temple is, and often Benjamin is associated with them. So, here's what Rehoboam does. He sends a guy named Adoniram to restore order, but they stone him to death. So he at first wants to retaliate Rehoboam. He's like, no, I'm not having that. Gets together 180,000 men, and he's going to go attack the north. But a prophet comes and says, nope, this is the Lord's doing. Don't fight your relatives. You're not going to do that. And so we see a brief moment of obedience here. He takes a defensive mode. He starts building up the towns and fortifying them. Okay, seems like a little obedience here. And again, the Levites go. That's where the temple is. So things look like they're going okay down in Judah. Meanwhile, in the north, 1 Kings 12.25, Jeroboam then built up the city of Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, and it became his capital. Later, he went and built up the town of Peniel. Jeroboam thought to himself, Unless I am careful, the kingdom will return to the dynasty of David. When these people go to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord, because that's where the Levites are, they will again give their allegiance to King Rehoboam of Judah. They will kill me and make them, him their king instead. So Shechem, you might not catch that. That has a bad association. If you remember way back in Genesis, the rape of Dina or Dinah, that was Shechem who did that. So it's already like eh, a sketchy story. What Jeroboam does is he doubles down on Aaron's sin in Exodus 32. He doesn't just make one gold calf, if you remember the story. He makes two. He also replaces the Festival of Shelters, one of the three pilgrimage festivals that they're supposed to be going to Jerusalem for. He's saying, ah, stay here at my idol worship party. Same language is used. O Israel, these are the gods that led you out of Egypt. So it's a doubling down. It would be particularly bad in the minds of people reading this, hearing about it. So Jeroboam in the north doesn't listen to God. And then this is what happens if we turn the page. 1 Kings 13, at the Lord's command, a man of God from Judah went to Bethel, arriving there just as Jeroboam was approaching the altar to burn incense. Then at the Lord's command, he shouted, O oh, altar, altar, this is what the Lord says. A child named Josiah will be born into the dynasty of David. On you, he will sacrifice the priests from the pagan shrines who come here to burn incense. And human bones will be burned on you. That same day, the man of God gave a sign to prove his message. He said, the Lord has promised to give this sign. This altar will split apart and its ashes will be poured out on the ground. Background, Josiah is a king that's going to appear about 300 years later. So it's a long time later and there's going to be all these reforms. The sign happens. Jeroboam's there worshiping as it says. He doesn't like it. So he says, seize that man. And his hand becomes paralyzed, stuck. He freaks out, asks the man of God, heal me, heal me, pray for me. So the man of God prays for him. The hand is healed. Jeroboam, thank you very much. You want to come over to my house for dinner? I don't have a parrot, so it'll be safe. <laughs> so I'll give you some gifts. We'll get something to eat. Now the man of God says something interesting. He's like, no, no, no. I have a command from the Lord, not just this prophecy. I'm not supposed to eat or drink anything while I'm here. And I got to go back a different way than the way I came. Okay. So now it gets interesting. There's kind of a weird story in here. And this is a really good reason why you got to read like larger sections. So that's why I do these things in sections for you. Some people just go, oh, here's a verse. And then I'm going to talk for 50 minutes about the verse and get everything out of context. 
You can't do it that way. You have to read larger sections of the Bible to understand what's happening here. So if you just read this story, you'd be like, what? So I'll tell it to you briefly. So you have the man of God, and then you have an old prophet. So the scene switches from what we just saw to the old prophet, but you have to remember it's connected to this other stuff. It's still important. So the old prophet has kids, sons, who tell him what happened. He said, where is he? i got to find this guy. So he goes and finds the man of God. He's sitting under a tree, and he asks him, are you the man of God who did all this? Yes, I am. Good. Why don't you come and eat with me? Second person to ask him this. He repeats the story. I cannot. I can't eat or drink anything while I'm here. Can't go back the same way I came. The old prophet says, ah, but... An angel of the Lord told me, basically, something different, that you should come and eat with me. He's lying. So the man of God goes into the old prophet's house. He's eating, and just then, now the Lord speaks to him. He says, you've broken my command. You won't be buried in the grave of your ancestors. Okay, so the old prophet saddles up his own donkey for him, and he heads out, and sure enough, a lion comes out and kills him but it doesn't kill the donkey. Well, the old prophet hears about it. He's really upset for the guy. So he goes out and he says, you know what? Bury him in my grave. He tells his sons, when I die, bury me. Put my bones near his bones. He says, bury me with that guy. Okay. And if it's all by itself, gee, that's weird. We didn't even get any names. So this guy deceives him and then he's, it just doesn't make sense. But when you read it in light of the whole thing, all of a sudden it does. This odd story has a purpose in highlighting the theme, the lessons we're supposed to be learning. That is, be careful who you listen to. Rehoboam, he listened to the younger people. Well, now it's an older guy. And am I not supposed to listen to the older guy? Well, when the older guy isn't following the Lord, when he's not saying what you already heard from the Lord, no, you don't listen to him either. So do you see the progression? Don't listen to the younger people. Sometimes older people aren't right. And this theme continues. It's worth mentioning, too, that Jeroboam, as well, his advisors told him, go ahead and make those gold calves. So it's a cycle here. So Jeroboam, he still hasn't changed his ways. Even after the whole thing with the hand, the man of God, everything, he's no good. The idol worship, it's bad. He's even installing false priests. So the Levites went down to Jerusalem. They're in charge of all the worship. He's like, ah, I'll just make new priests. So violating absolutely everything. So then Ahijah comes back on the scene. Remember him. He is the one that anointed Jeroboam in the north to become king. If we turn the page, 1 Kings 14, at that time, Jeroboam's son, Abijah, became very sick. So Jeroboam told his wife, disguise yourself so that no one will recognize you as my wife. Then go to the prophet Ahijah Shiloh, the man who told me I would become king. Take him a gift of 10 loaves of bread. Ah, 10 pieces of cloak. Interesting. Some cakes, a jar of honey, and ask him what will happen to the boy. So Ahijah at this time now, he's an old man, and the text says that he's blind. He can't see. But God tells him what's going on. He's a prophet. So this is what happens. 1 Kings 14, 6. So when Ahijah heard her footsteps at the door, he called out, Come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why are you pretending to be someone else? Then he told her, I have bad news for you. Give your husband Jeroboam this message from the Lord, the God of Israel. I promoted you from the ranks of the common people and made you ruler over my people Israel. I ripped the kingdom away from the family of David and gave it to you. But you have not been like my servant David, who obeyed my commands and followed me with all his heart and always did whatever I wanted. Hyperbole. You have done more evil than all who lived before you. You have made other gods for yourself and have made me furious with your gold calves. And since you have turned your back on me, I will bring disaster on your dynasty and I will destroy every one of your male descendants, slave and free alike, anywhere in Israel. I will burn up your royal dynasty as one burns up trash until it's all gone. Jeroboam did not listen. And so he pays the price. And like Solomon, so does his son. 
Here's what happens. 1 Kings 14, 17. So Jeroboam's wife returned to Terzah, and the child died just as she walked through the door of her home. And all Israel buried him and mourned for him, as the Lord had promised through the prophet Ahijah. The rest of the events in Jeroboam's reign, including his wars and how he ruled, are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. Jeroboam reigned in Israel 22 years. When Jeroboam died, his son Nadab became the next king. It gets a little confusing because then it says, meanwhile... And then there's some other stuff. This is a summary of Jeroboam's reign. He will appear again in the next chapter. Kind of another confusing thing, just to make a side note, we could talk about it more at Bible study, which is a continuation of the message. There are two Abijahs here. So this is another thing where the Bible's crazy confusing because you have Ahijah the prophet, and then, wait, Jeroboam's son, Abijah. And then if you keep reading, Rehoboam has a son, Abijah. And so your Bible might say Abijam because they're trying to unconfuse you is what they're doing. But they're both Abijah. Abijah is going to be the next king of Israel. Jeroboam's son dies as a penalty for what he's done. Now we get a summary of Rehoboam's reign, and it's just bad. He has all this idol worship going on. He has male and female prostitutes. It's detestable, the Bible says. Horrible. So God's going to send Shishak, the king of Egypt, to attack him, cause trouble, plunder all this wealth that he's been worshiping so much, take the gold shields, all kinds of bad things. But if we hop over briefly to Second Chronicles, it tells us it's not all bad. He humbles himself, actually. So God's anger doesn't completely destroy him, is what the text says. 1 Kings 14, 29, the rest of the events in Rehoboam's reign and everything he did are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. There was constant war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. When Rehoboam died, he was buried among his ancestors in the city of David. His mother was Nama, an Ammonite woman. Then his son Abijam, or Abijah, became the next king. Rehoboam abandoned the counsel of his wise elders or advisors. He turned to his friends. Rehoboam and Jeroboam, as we saw, including with the old man and the prophet, they're not listening to the right people. That is the theme for this section. Rehoboam rejects the old advisors for the young advisors. Jeroboam rejects God for his own advisors. The man of God rejects God for a false prophet. Even prophets can be wrong. And so we should ask ourselves, how do we know good advice? How do we know who's right? How does this work? Who should we listen to? Well, Rehoboam should have listened to the older advisors, but then we saw a story where sometimes the old people can be wrong too. So what are the qualifiers? How do we know? Well, first, we must be in the Word. That's why it's important. We have instructions from God. It's all right there. It addresses a lot of issues. We're going to see some today, but it addresses everything. It's God. Pretty smart guy. So we have the instruction manual, and you need to be in the Word, all of us. It's not enough for you to just listen to me, because how do you know you should listen to me? He'll tell you. He's checking my work, and we encourage that here. It doesn't bother me. Why? Because I'm in the Word. I know it. But you should not just trust everyone implicitly. Even if you love me, you trust me, we have, we're friends. Still checks it. And I tell him to, because I could be wrong. I'm just a person. That's it. Check Everybody's, what we saw in this series, even some really famous teachings are dead wrong. They're just wrong. People like this popular stuff because it's cheap and easy, as I said. Well, here's the thing. When you're really in the Word, it's like this, if you're not. It's like music. Even if you're not a musician, I'm a musician from my past. I can hear bad notes real quick. It happens all the time because I'm trained. But even if you're not, I bet you would recognize, picture your favorite song. Do not sing it right now. I don't need to hear that. But <laughs> just, just saying, I won't sing either. But 
even your favorite song. You would know if somebody different was singing it. If it wasn't the original artist, you'd go, ooh, that's different. Bad cover song. And you definitely probably know, like, the wrong note. Why? Because you listen to it a lot. You're familiar with it. And so when you're in the Word a lot, that's what it's like. It's almost like I can't even listen to most preaching anymore, especially popular stuff, because it's like, oh, that's bad. That's not true. I told you about the fear thing, right? I started getting in the Word, and I'm like, huh? This fear not 360 it does not sound consistent with what I've been reading at all. And we discovered it's way off. It's not even close to being true. It's actually the opposite. But it's a popular teaching, Pastor. Read your Bible. If everybody did that, it wouldn't be so popular. That's the first key. We talked about the fruit of the Spirit. Important. Very plain to see, especially Galatians 5. Read it. The fruit of the Spirit. We know someone is operating by the flesh. And they're just angry all the time. They're prideful. They're causing division, especially in the church. They're causing division, dissension. That's the fruit of the flesh. That's evil. That's what the devil does. Comes in here, operates within a person or two who are angry, complaining all the time. They always have problems. But the Word of God comes through people who exhibit, Paul tells us right after that, exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. No tree by its fruit. What are they? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. That is the fruit of the Spirit. We should be joyful. I'm going to heaven. That's cool. <laughs> I'm going to heaven. What? is your problem if you're going to heaven? Is it because you think you're not? I'm done with this place. <laughs> heaven, that's awesome. My dad's funeral, I annoyed so many people. So many people at his funeral. Because I was like, this is great. That miserable old man is finally in heaven. He was miserable. This is wonderful. Like a few people got it. I'm like, high five. He hated it here. Especially for those of you who are sick or going through, oh, enough. Go to heaven. All right? No, don't take your life. <laughs> God, let God do that. You know, pastor responsible for mass suicide. <laughs> do not. <laughs> Disclaimer, do not. That's God's job. He'll take you out when you need to be taken out. <laughs> uh, so once we check those boxes... Right? Once we see an individual who sounds like the Word of God, when people come here and they say, oh, man, there's too many scriptures, I'm like, <laughs> just more God, less me. But when the person sounds like the Word of God, when you're there and it all lines up, it's like, yep, 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 okay, good. Then that person is joyful because he's going to heaven, right? He loves you. He's humble. Okay, check, check. Now we're going to get into some practical stuff. We want to look for people with wisdom and experience. That's why they call them elders in the Bible. Elders in the church. People are qualified. Now, it's important, and you should read this. There are qualifications. It's hard. It should be really hard to be what we call a pastor. It should be really, really hard, like Navy SEAL training. The dropout rate for seminary is nuts. My mentor called it cemetery. Nuts, because it's hard. It's hard. It's a job you just, it's so hard to fake. Can't do it. It should be difficult. And we should hold those elders to those standards. That's who you judge. That's okay. 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1. They're almost the same. Letters written to Paul, the apostle, to his like guys, you know, the main guys. They're elders or other overseers in the church. And we see in those qualifications, it's identical to the fruit of the Spirit. They're supposed to be loving, humble, They're supposed to be kind people filled with joy, the fruit of the Spirit. And it also says they need to be in the Word. 1 Timothy 4, Paul continues telling Timothy, 
He's like a pastor. He's like me in the church. Be constantly nourished by the Scriptures. How often? All the time. All the time. So that's the other thing. So if we go to God's Word, we see something about listening and learning through this process. Biblical discipleship. Some would refer to it as the Paul, Barnabas, and Timothy method. In our lives, and this isn't just the pastors, in our lives we should have someone ahead of us, someone mentoring us, someone we can learn from with more experience. We should have someone we can do life with. That's like a Barnabas if you know the word well. So what we're doing life with, maybe he'll argue with us or she will argue with us, right? Hold us accountable too on a personal level. And then someone like, a little behind us, like a Timothy, Paul was to Timothy, someone behind us that we're, we're mentoring. So the process continues. It's important. This is how we disciple. The Western church doesn't do enough of it. This is how we disciple. What we do is we implement worldly kind of programs and just assign ourselves to all these programs. And this age group will go over here, and they'll just do that program that we paid too much money for. This group will go over here. The youth, they're all going to go over there and do life over there. And that's what we do. We do the program church instead of the discipleship church. That's not how it works. It should resemble a family. That's biblical discipleship. We get a picture of a family. Titus, interesting book. It's like the short field manual for pastors. It's really what it is. Three short chapters. I love it. Starts out, he's telling Titus, look, I left you on the island of Crete. He's trained them to appoint elders in each town or city. Notice the word appoint if you're reading along, not vote in. He's like a man of God. So he's godly, appointing people, training them, discipling them, appoint them in the churches. Then he gives those credentials. When you appoint these people, they must be good family people, upstanding fathers, husbands. They should be kind and gracious, able to teach. they got to know the word real well. And he gives some warnings about false prophets, says some not-so-nice things about Cretans. We'll move on. <laughs> and then we see a description of a community of believers. And I want to share this with you. Titus 1, Titus 2, verse 1. As for you, Titus, this is Paul writing to Titus, promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. Teach the older men to exercise, ah, self-control, to be worthy of respect and to live wisely. They must have sound faith and be filled with love and patience. Three fruits of the Spirit. So these are just the older men. This is not necessarily elders. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Apparently, that was a problem in Crete for the ladies. Instead, they should teach others what is good. These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely and to be pure, to work in their homes, to do good and to be submissive to their husbands. Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. The word there is they will not blaspheme the word of God in Greek. It's really bad. You can do that with your actions. A lot of people don't know that. So, Titus is like the man of God. And did you notice that? Compare it to the lesson we learned today from the Old Testament. You see, the older men, they might not always be right. <laughs> if they're not, correct them. Make sure they're filled with the fruit of the Spirit. The older women, they might not always be right. So, what is it? What I said before. If they're not exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit... No, or if you're in my position, correct. <laughs> Got to get back in line with that. Then did you notice, community of believers together, what are the older women doing? They're training up the younger women. How can we do that if we're not a good example? We learned about that recently. Hypocrites. Hypocrites can't teach anybody. They're not credible. In our Western culture, we often abandon our elders. We do that. We abandon our elders. Now, I'm not talking about having your elders in a care facility or someplace because you're not a doctor. I'm not talking about that. We abandon our elders, even while they're still alive and well. We just cast them aside and we seek companionship with people our own age. We miss those other two positions, helping other people, mentoring them, and learning. We just hit an age and we decide we know everything, and that's it. I'm just going to hang out with a bunch of other people that tell me I'm right. 
We're just going to agree with one another. There's not even accountability anymore. We don't, we don't do that. Don't correct anybody. Can't do that. Just people will validate our opinions, and that's what they are, opinions. It's not wise, it's not biblical, and that's why it doesn't work. It does not work. And it's kind of funny. I've observed, I've had young people come in, and they say, I'm really looking for a church with people my own age. Huh? Yeah. Or they'll ask about youth group. You have a youth group? Because that's what I really want to do. You were boring. You didn't like my parrot story? Nope. You're too old. I want people my age. I can translate that for you, for most young guys. Where are all the chicks? <laughs> Talking about birds, right? Where are the girls at? I've actually been told that. Years ago, I had a person leave our church and the worship team, and the stated purpose was, I'm going to the bigger church because there are more people my age to have sex with. That's true. There are more people my age and I get more opportunities. Wow, really? That's amazing. And it's really amazing to me because these are churched people. So like, if they've been in church, they should know this. Like, this is stupid. It's weird. Because even in the secular world, if you know my past, I was not always a pastor. <laughs> I was not groomed to be a pastor, that's what I'm saying. It's difficult. A big change. Right? I was in the martial arts business. Boy, that's all the way over here. But both jobs are kind of like being a zookeeper. They're kind of the same. So <clears throat> it, it all worked out for me. <laughs> but in martial arts, right, you seek out like older, wiser, think, you know, Mr. Miyagi. I was going to say Cobra Kai, but they say so many bad words I can't recommend it. Anyway, <laughs> Mr. Miyagi, right? Like he's an older, wiser guy. Why? Self-control. You're teaching someone some really dangerous stuff. And so, you better be preaching self-control along with that. You need it. You can't have all those tools and not have self-control. I've seen what happens. It's not good. And so I would seek out like older, wiser people. I had a lot of information. I knew stuff. That's what I sought out. I used to shoot birds like the farmer. Clay birds, it's okay. I used to go skeet shooting every day in New York. You can't play golf all year. I don't even play golf here anyway. But skeet shooting is a really good winter sport. You can do it all year. And so I used to go almost every day. Every day I would skeet shoot. And at that gun club, I don't think there was anybody under the age of 70. Why? Because they're all retired. I was a business person. I'll do what I want. And so I would go skeet shooting. But... When young guys would come in, I'd always be better than them. Better form, better tech, guys my, my age at that time. I'd be better. Why? Because I applied myself to listening to the old timers. I've been doing it for a long time. All the little tricks, the techniques, they start giving you that stuff. They're at a point in life where they want to just give that and pass that information along to someone. I'll take it. It was awesome. I got pretty good. I applied it even there. Church, when I came into church. So I knew this. I, I didn't come into church. We were small like this. Less people, actually. I came in, and I'm like, okay, I want to learn some things. Look for older people. So I started hanging out with people who were a little ahead of me. Some people my age, I became like best friends with the pastor. Yeah, I want to learn. Then my mentor. My mentor had 30-some years of experience running churches. I just rub up against him, soak up the information. I spent hours with him, just shadowing him, being right by his side all the time, watching, annoying him, asking him a lot of questions. But that's how I learned. I learned way more, way more from doing that. That and being in the Word. That's how I learned everything. School, classes, sermons. I didn't learn anything. The Word, my mentor, everything I needed to know. So if we know these things in the world, not everybody here is a pastor, shouldn't they be applied even more in the church? Shouldn't we be doing it like that in the church? Where we're looking, you know, we really want to hang on every word of some of our elders and learn. 
wow, that was amazing. You lived through that. Tell, tell me about that. Don't we need to adopt that attitude? Shouldn't we be humble like that? And also, by the way, loving to our elders, taking care of them. Instead, we have too many young and inexperienced people leading young and inexperienced people. It's Rehoboam and his friends. I see a lot of today's youth casting aside their elders and just running themselves off a cliff. They could have saved themselves a lot of time. But birds of a feather flock together. In 1 Corinthians, there are a lot of people. It's a letter from Paul to Corinth, and they're saying and doing a lot of dumb stuff. And Paul's got to correct it. It's really what the letter's all about over and over again. They even say Jesus either already raised from the dead or he didn't raise from the dead. All this bad stuff. He's got to correct it. And as he does in chapter 5, in chapter 15, he's saying, don't hang around those people. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Don't be fooled by those who say such things for bad company corrupts good character. Birds of a feather. We should seek balance in our relationships and make sure we're hanging out with people who are a good influence on us, who build us up in the Lord, who we can learn from. It's important to seek out those types of relationships in our walk. We need to be careful who we associate with because with whom we associate, we may assimilate. Let me pray for you. I pray that God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you the spirit of wisdom and the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Amen.